This talk is an advanced tutorial for administrators of HD Condor pools. In it, we will cover how user prior priority and fair share works, how users can be given higher priority than others, and how the negotiator decides how to assign resources to users, or, in short, fairness in Condor and how to avoid it. The agenda for this talk is focused on the Condor negotiator team, which is responsible for many of these decisions. We'll start by looking at what, exactly, the negotiator does in an HD Condor pool. Then, we'll cover priorities for individual users, then move on to what Condor can do to bias one user over another. Overall, though, I'd like administrators to think not so much about what primitives HD Condor can implement, but what the best policy is for your particular pool and your particular users. The learning agenda for this talk will cover these issues. After this talk, an HD Condor administrator will be able to configure a pool to give a user twice the CPUs of another, or make sure multi-core jobs have priority over single-core jobs, or guarantee that every job has a one-hour minimum before any preemption may happen. And if, say, an external license limits the number of running jobs to some number, how to have Condor implement that limit. But, just to be clear, one of these can't be done by the negotiator, and by the end of this talk, you will understand why and how to implement this limit outside the negotiator. Let's start by reviewing the three main components of an HD Condor system, the submit side, the central manager, and the execute or worker node side. Remember that these are functional breakdowns, not physical, and any one machine may perform more than one of these roles in, in a small pool. The start D, which is responsible for the worker node, is a very limited view of the whole pool. In fact, you could say that it is nearsighted. Every decision the start D makes is based on inputs from at most three sources. Attributes of the machine, either automatically discovered, such as the amount of physical memory or cores of the machine, or attributes that a human administrator has configured into it, like the purchaser of the machine, or maybe where it physically is. If there is a job running on the worker node, attributes of this job, such as who submitted it, or how much memory it is using, can factor into the start D's decision to evict or preempt it. And finally, if presented with a potential new job candidate to run, the start D can certainly look at attributes of this new job to decide whether it wants to run it and if it needs to preempt some other job in order to run the new one. But that's it. The start D knows nothing about the other jobs that may be running or idle in the system or what's going on on any neighboring, neighboring worker nodes. As such, all of the decisions the start D makes are very localized. The mission of the SCED D is to hold all the jobs given to it and to run them in some order on start D slots that the negotiator has given to its submitters. The inputs of the SCED D are all the jobs that have been submitted to it and all the machine slots that the negotiator has assigned or provisioned to it. With these inputs, the SCED D can reuse a slot for more than one job in sequence. And given a set of jobs from a submitter, to pick which job goes first, as long as it fits in that slot, that is to say, it matches with the given slot. Right now, the SCED D cannot reuse a slot across different submitters, but this is not fundamental and may, in fact, change in the future. Now, in HD Condor, there's a distinction between a user and a submitter. These two words mean very different things, and it's easy to confuse them. So, Let's clear that up right now. A user is an OS construct. When we talk about users in HD Condor on Linux, we mean the Unix user ID that the process can run. In an HD Condor pool, the namespace of users may be different from machine to machine, and it is common to have worker nodes who don't have password file entries for the user who have submitted jobs from the submit machine. Ultimately, though, when HD Condor runs a job, it must run it as some operating system user even if that varies depending on what worker node it happens to choose to run the job on. A submitter, on the other hand, is an HD Condor construct. The submitter records live mainly in the negotiator and are global for the pool. The submitter is what HD Condor uses for accounting and scheduling. The submitter for a job stays constant throughout the job's life, even if that job runs as a different operating system user on different worker nodes. 
As we'll see in a bit, the counter user prior command always works in terms of submitters, and the Unix PS command only knows about users. What makes this distinction a little confusing is that, in the usual case, the submitter and the user are often the same. In an HT counter job, we would call the user who submitted the job's owner. While there frequently is a one-to-one -one mapping between owner and submitter, there doesn't need to be. In the usual case, if the Unix user gthane runs counter submit with this submit file, the owner attribute of the job will be set to gthane, and the submitter attribute will also be set to gthane, with the UID domain of the SCED D, whatever that's set to, appended to it. This means that if gthane submits to two different SCED D machines in the same pool, and the administrator has configured the counter parameter UID domain to be the same, counter will treat these two as the same submitter for accounting and scheduling purposes. In other words, one, a person gains no scheduling advantage by submitting jobs to two different SCEDDs. They are one submitter in the system. However, this relationship between owner and submitter is not always one-to-one. -one. one human owner can submit jobs to different submitters. There are several ways to do this, but the most important, the most straightforward, is the nice user submitter. If the parameter nice user is set to true in a counter submit file, the job is submitted not as the normal submitter, but with a new submitter identity that has a nice user prefix in front of it. htconder gives this nice user a much worse priority than any other non-nice user, so it is an easy way to submit backfill priority jobs. However, because this nice user is a different submitter identity than the one the human user would normally have, it means that any usage that the nice user submitter accrues is not charged to the normal submitter. And this is important because historical usage is one way, maybe the main way, that HTCondor does fair share scheduling. That is, submitters, not owners, but submitters, who have used a lot of resources in the, in the recent past, are penalized by the fair share scheduler to not get as many resources in the future. So, if I have some backfill priority jobs and other jobs at the same time, which are normal, all the usage of my nice user jobs make no impact whatsoever in the priority of my normal jobs. This is one way that the separation of owners and submitters is useful in an HTCondor system. With that, let's end our diversion about submitters and owners and return to the subject at hand, the negotiator. We've talked about the role of the start D and the role of the sked D. What's the role of the negotiator? The negotiator service is like a Greek goddess of justice, weighing up the scales of justice, dividing the pools fairly for each submitter. Specifically, the role of the negotiator is to assign slots from the whole pool that it manages to each submitter, not owners or users, as we may accidentally or casually say, but to submitters, based on some policy that the administrator has set that is fair. Now, the eagle-eyed among you may have noticed something here, and that is a term that is missing. What term is missing? The negotiator knows nothing of jobs. Again, we may casually and incorrectly say that the negotiator matches jobs to users, but both terms are technically wrong. The negotiator only knows about submitters and their requests, and actually knows nothing of jobs. We'll see later how that makes a big difference in how the system works, but for now it is important to try to always think of the negotiator in terms of assigning slots to submitters. Moving on, the inputs the negotiator uses to make decisions include all of the slots in the pool, all of the submitters in the pool, their priorities and quotas, and one request for slots from a submitter at a time. As you can see, the negotiator is thus the only place in Condor with a global view of the system, the, and thus the only place that global policies can be put into place. The start D only sees what is happening on that one machine. The sked D can't see any jobs from any other sked D. Only the negotiator has this global view. So this separation of one component with a global view, the negotiator, working with many components at the edge, SCEDDs, each of which has a local view, is key to HD scalability. The one central part doesn't need to make decisions quickly. 
it can hand out assignments to many different SCEDDs, which can then operate independently. As such, the negotiator tends to run more deliberately, making global decisions, and the SCEDDs make decisions more quickly with just their local knowledge. In a nutshell, here's how the negotiator works. It runs on a periodic loop we call the negotiation cycle. Once per cycle, it tries to rebalance the ratio of slots assigned to submitters. If preemption is enabled, it will initiate preemption in order, in order to do so. If preemption is disabled, it will try to do so by assigning some submitters to empty slots. At the end of the cycle, it sleeps for a short, configurable amount of time to let the system work to achieve this new balance, and then it runs the cycle again. As such, the negotiator is always a little bit out of date, but that's okay, as it makes decision at a slower cadence. And in a distributed system, we must always live with a lack of global clock or global synchronization. Let's start with one of the simplest possible negotiator policies, concurrency limits. Actually, concurrency limits are implemented in both the SCEDI and the negotiator, but it's configured in the negotiator. Concurrency limits are very useful, very easy to understand, and many pool administrators don't know much about them. Because they exist in the negotiator, they can enforce pool-wide limits in ways that neither the start nor the SCED alone can. Examples when concurrency limits are useful include when an administrator may want to limit the number of jobs that use NFS to maybe 100 because the NFS server crashes when there are more than that. Or maybe you have licensed software and you can only run some fixed number of instances of that software. Or maybe you want to limit the number of active database connections to some database from jobs to 10 running jobs because you'll overload the database server otherwise. All of these policies can be implemented with concurrency limits. Concurrency limits are very easy to configure. First, you pick a name for one. In this case, we'll use NFS, DB, and license for three different limits. Then, in the negotiator's Condor configuration, add limit name underscore limit equals the, val equals the value of that limit. A Condor reconfig will then pick up the new value. Here, we are setting the NFS limit to 100, the database to 42, and the license to 5. So, we will limit the jobs in the system to 100 running NFS jobs, 42 database jobs, and 5 license jobs, no matter what the SCED or submitter they came from is. For HT Condor to enforce these limits, it will also need to know which jobs use these limits. So, to use them, just add this to the job submit file. You add a line before the queue statement that says concurrency limits equals the name of the limit. Here, we're telling the Condor that this particular job needs an NFS concurrency limit token. And the units of these are arbitrary. It's whatever you want them to be. In this case, we're telling Condor that this job uses four concurrency limit units. Maybe some NFS jobs use more service, server resources than others, and this is how you can weigh them. And for jobs which may use more than one kind of concurrency limit, you can set a comma-separated list to request more than one kind of limit. When Condor gets this job, it will not schedule more than the concurrency limits worth of either NFS or database. So, with that, going back to our four truths and a lie slide, you should now know that this last one here is a truth. We now know how to put a limit on licensed jobs in the pool. Any guesses on which of the remaining statements are truths or lies? We'll move on. While concurrency limits are very easy to set up and to use, they're usually just one part of the picture. One thing to be aware of is they can throw off other balancing algorithms. If a system only allows three NFS jobs to run, user priorities and quotas might not matter so much as as this one limit. Another thing to be aware of is there's no fair share of limits across users. They're handed out first come, first serve, so it is common for one early submitter to monopolize the limit, so be aware of this. Now let's move on to the negotiator proper and look at how it decides to assign slots to submitters. The main loop of the negotiator cycle has four steps, which it repeats every cycle. First, it gets all the slots in the pool. Then, gets all the submitters. After that, 
It computes the number of slots each submitter should get. Then it hands out the match slots to submitters in priority order. Sometimes for debugging priority decisions that the negotiator makes, or to understand it better, it is helpful for an administrator to run each of these steps independently in order. And it turns out, HD Connor provides primitives to do each of these substeps, substeps by yourself. We're not gonna implement the negotiator here as a shell script, but I'm gonna show you the shell commands to mimic each of these parts of the cycle. The first step, as we said, is to get all the slots in the pool, claimed or unclaimed. I hope that any HD Connor administrator, even a beginning one, can do the equivalent from the shell. You can do this simply by running Connor status. By default, the negotiator gets all the slots in the pool, but there is a knob, negotiator slot constraint, that is a class add expression that is evaluated against each add in the pool. When this expression evaluates to true, that add is considered part of this pool the negotiator should use. By using this knob, advanced administrators can split or shard the pool and have multiple negotiators operate on distinct subsets of the pool. But th that's advanced usage. Let's assume for the sake of example that our pool has these slots in it. And the negotiator looks at the name, the state, and the remote owner attribute of all these slots. From this, the negotiator builds a table, like this pie chart here, noting the percentage each submitter has claimed, as well as any slots currently unclaimed. Step two is to get all the submitters. And we repeat this process in the shell by running the counter status dash submitters command. This displays one add per active submitter in the pool and their aggregate number of running, idle, and held jobs. In general, this is a very handy command for administrators to know, and I feel like it's often an underused, or underused command in the counter administrator's toolbox. And again, to motivate an example, the output of counter status might look like this in some sample pool. The negotiator then notes any submitters that have no idle jobs and discards those submitters. These submitters need no new matches, so we will ignore them for the remainder of this negotiation cycle. Step three is the most complicated part. It is to compute the per submitter share. There are many factors that go into this, but the primary one is historical usage. The more a submitter has used of the pool recently, the less likely the negotiator is to give them more resources in this current cycle. The pool-wide or per submitter historical data the negotiator uses is stored in the accountant, which can be queried with the counter user prio command. Like counter status dash submitter, counter user prio is a command that is very useful and that many, especially beginning administrators, don't know much about. It is a quick way to get an overview of all the active submitters in a counter pool and their current and historical usage. I suggest you get to know it. The output of counter user prio for our example pool might look something like this. Note that I've removed some columns of the output of counter user prio in order to make it fit better on the screen. Effective priority, notice this effective priority column, is what the negotiator uses to compute the fair share. Res in use is the number of cores currently in use by that submitter. And if you look carefully, you'll see that the effective priority is simply the product of the real priority and the priority factor. The priority factor is the setting the administrator uses per submitter to control what percentage of the pool one submitter should get with respect to others. More on that later. So where does real priority come from? It is a single number that represents smooth historical usage. So, if a submitter has used 1,000 cores continuously for a very long time, that submitter's real priority will be 1,000. If they start using fewer than 1,000 cores, their real priority will exponentially decay to whatever their current usage is. Just as the priority exponentially decays downward when the submitter lowers their usage, so too does it exponentially grow upwards when their usage increases. To make the math work out, the lowest possible value of real priority is 0.5 and can never go lower than that. The half-life of this exponential decay, or growth, is set by the knob priority half-life. This knob, in seconds, 
has a default of 24 hours. So a submitter who has never submitted any jobs suddenly submits 100 jobs, and they'll start running. After 24 hours, their real priority will be 50, assuming the default priority half-life. Note that priority half-life can only be set globally for everyone in the pool. Different submitters cannot today have personalized priority half-lives. Or, to view this graphically, if the purple line represents actual usage in real time, the red line will represent the real priority at any point in that time. Note how it grows and shrinks exponentially. But some sites do not want historical usage to play a part in the calculation of how much a submitter should get right now. Once a submitter has stopped using any slots, those sites would like HDConter forget about, to forget about past usage and have it play no role. The easiest solution to this is to set the priority half-life very small. For example, setting it to 1 will result in a priority curve that looks something like this. The priority curve matches pretty much the usage curve. Now, moving on to getting the historical or not so historical usage, we will remember that we displayed it with the counter user prio command, and it may return something like this. We now know what each of these columns represent, and we know the negotiator uses the effective priority to decide how many resources each submitter should get. So, how does it do that? What does effective priority really mean? Quite simply, Effective priority is the ratio of the pool that each submitter should get with respect to each other, where lower is better. Looking at our example again, with numbers rounded to make the math work easier, let's assume that submitters Alice, Bob, and Charlie have effective priorities of 1,000, 2,000, and 2,000, respectively, and that there are eight total one core slots in this pool. This means that Alice, who has an effective priority of 1,000, deserves twice as many slots as Bob and Charlie. And Bob and Charlie deserve the same number of slots as each other because they have the same effective priority. Working out the math, of the eight total cores, Alice deserves to get four, and Bob and Charlie should each get two. Note this number isn't the new number of cores or slots to give out, but it represents the total they should have, counting earlier matches as well as maybe future ones. So, with all that, we should understand how the priority factor works and what it can be used for. The priority factor is set with the counter user prio dash set factor command line, like shown here. When it's set, it allows the administrator to say that one submitter should get some higher or lower ratio of the pool while also considering historical usage. And this graph shows the results of setting the priority factor in a graphic manner. Again, the purple line shows actual usage, and the blue, green, and red lines show what the effective priority would be if the priority factor was set to three different values. Setting the user priority factor is the first and most powerful tool that administrators have to control the relative allocation of their pools. Okay, now let's have a quick quiz to make sure that we are all understanding priorities and priority factors. Let's say the pool is completely idle, and the administrator sets Alice's priority factor to 500 and Bob's to 1,000. How many machines will each submitter get? Of course, this is a bit of a trick question. Alice will get twice as many CPUs as Bob, but she will only get twice as many CPUs if they both have enough jobs to fill the pool. If Alice has zero jobs in the queue, Bob is allowed to use the whole pool, and vice versa. Or, if Alice has just one job, Bob can use every other CPU except that one in the pool, uh, again, provided he has enough jobs. Going back to the negotiation cycle, we've covered the tricky part in number three above, so let's move on. After this, it is pretty much smooth sailing. The next step is after having calculated how many slots each submitter should get, to hand out slots to try and meet those deserved ratios. Returning to our three submitters, let's assume that we've got a target allocation as from before. 
four CPUs for Alice and two each for Bob and Charlie. Remember, this is the total target allocation, including previous allocations, and knew when to make up the total. So, we then look at current usage. Let's assume that from previous negotiation cycles, Alice has been given three cores and Bob one. Remember, this comes from the res in use column from the counter user pointer command. The negotiator then calculates the difference between what the goal is and what the current values are, and comes up with a number for each submitter for the number of new cores it tries to give out in this negotiation cycle. This number is called the submitter limit and can often be seen if you look in the negotiator's debug log. In this case, Alice and Bob deserve one more core, and Charlie, who is currently running zero jobs, two more cores. Only now, when the negotiator knows how many resources each submitter deserves, does it begin matching and handing out slots. The negotiator always goes in effective priority order, with the lower, or better, effective priority going earlier in the negotiation cycle. And here's a remarkable fact. For all of the many aspects of Condor, which are configurable, and there are a lot of them, this ordering is not configurable in any way. Let me say that again. This ordering is not configurable in any way. The negotiator always goes in priority order. This can have a big impact on scheduling. The submitter who has the best priority can often grab the most desirable machine in the pool, either the fastest or the one with the most memory, even if that submitter can run elsewhere, and even if assigning that one desirable machine may prevent a, a submitter with even worse priority from running at all. That is, there's no way to say in the negotiator, all the big jobs go first, no matter who submitted them, or all the not jobs that need GPUs go first. We can only say, adjust the priority factors of submitters so that this submitter goes first. And that returns us to the one lie from the beginning. There is no way in the negotiator to always schedule multi-core jobs before single-core jobs, because remember, the negotiator always prioritizes based on submitter, not based on aspects of jobs. There are other ways to accomplish this in HD Condor, but just not with the negotiator and priority. Once we've decided who has the best effective priority, the negotiator fetches not jobs, but resource requests from the SCEDD that holds that submitter's jobs. You can mimic this by running the condor q-autocluster command to see what requests jobs in a SCEDD coalesce to. This allows the SCEDD to compress the amount of information it sends to the negotiator. Instead of sending one job per request, it sends one resource request and a count of jobs in that request. For example, if Alice has two kinds of jobs, maybe a big memory and low memory jobs, or in this case, Linux jobs and Windows jobs, the SCEDD will send a description of the jobs and a count. Given these resource requests from the SCEDD, the negotiator will then find all machines that match the request. So, if the first request was for 10 Linux machines with two gigabytes of memory, the negotiator would go through the set of all machines, claimed or idle, and then cross off those machines which did not match the request. Note that it does not stop at the first machine that matches. It produces a list of all the matches. Having done that with all these matches, it then sorts the mat matches so that it can give the submitter the best possible match for the resource request at hand. It does this with three sort keys in sort priority order. Two of these sort expressions are defined in the negotiator's configuration, negotiator pre-job rank and negotiator post-job rank. The third, just rank, comes from the jobs submit file. Why are there three sort criteria? These three are ordered. That is, we first sort all the match slots by the value we get by evaluating the negotiator pre-job rank expression against both the candidate job and the potential matching machine. The negotiator then sorts all of the match slots by this value. If there are any ties, we go down to the next sort key, 
can sort all those ties by rank. If there are still ties after these first two sorts, those are broken by negotiator post-job rank. So what is a common use case for these keys? Well, the negotiator pre-job rank is very strong, and it represents the wants and needs of the administrator of the pool. If you've wanted to match the fastest job machines first, you could use this negotiator pre-job rank expression. Sometimes, if you want to try and pack jobs into the best fit, you may set negotiator pre-job rank to the smallest amount of memory of all those jobs that fit. Remember, it is only matched slots that we sort. Another use case has to do with defragmentation. Some sites logically order all of their machines and try and pack single core jobs onto one logical side of the cluster and multi-core jobs on the opposite virtual side and try to grow the usage of both towards the center. This can minimize the amount of multi-core defragmentation that needs to happen in the pool. And the negotiator pre-job rank is a great tool to do this. Now, having the sorted list of matched machines, we give those matches away to the smitter, up to the smitter limit. If we hit the smitter limit, there will be a message hit smitter limit in the negotiator log. If there are fewer requests in this group than the smitter limit, the negotiator gets the next request from the smitter from the SCEDD and rematches and resorts again. Now, and all of that was just for one submitter. Let's say it was for Alice. We then move on to the next submitter in effective priority order. In this case, Bob. But it isn't quite this simple. Up to now, we assume that every resource request matched every slot, and that every submitter has a sufficiently large supply of jobs to fill up their priority fair share. What happens if a submitter does not have enough jobs to fill their fair share? Or what happens if a submitter has plenty of jobs, but not enough of them match in order to fill the fair share? In this case, there will be leftovers. And if there are leftovers, we repeat this whole process again, starting with the best priority submitter and again, submitting submitters with, skipping submitters with no requests, or submitters who haven't been able to match any requests in pre previous iterations of this loop. Because of this, the fair share is not an absolute upper bound. If Alice has a priority, which gives her most of the pool, that does not guarantee that she can fill the pool, should she not have sufficient jobs, or if these jobs are too selective and don't match many machines. So, this leads to a big policy question. Do we want the negotiator to match and preempt slots that are already claimed by someone else? Or do we never want to preempt and only hand out idle slots to submitters? Either one has trade-offs, and the negotiator supports either policy. By default, there is no preemption, which means that there is less bad put because of preemption, but it also means that allocation is less fair because a submitter who submits earlier than someone else may get the whole pool as long as their jobs keep running. The main parameter that controls preemption is the class ad expression preemption requirements. This is a configuration parameter for the negotiator. It is evaluated in the context of the job request ad and a claimed slot ad. If it evaluates to true, then this claimed slot is eligible for preemption. If set unconditionally to false, as it is here, and as in the, is the default, no slot will ever be preempted. Example values may look like this. Here, we are looking at the remote user prio attribute of a claimed slot ad and the submitter prio of a job request ad. Remember from earlier that numerically lower values of priorities represent better priorities. So, in this case, we are saying that we are willing to preempt a job if the preempting job has 20% better priority. When preempting because of priority, it is always better to have some slack, like this 20% here. This is because priorities are always changing with usage. And if we preempted if one priority was strictly better than another, as soon as the preempting job started running, that submitter's priority would start increasing and would likely get preempted back to the next cycle, and so on, 
leading to 100% bad put or fresh it. And just like we sorted the match slots, we also sort the preempting slots by preemption rank. Like negotiator pre-job rank, this preemption rank is a class add expression defined in the negotiator's config file, and it is evaluated in the context of the job request add and the slot add. This lets us choose which of the many potential slots to preempt when many match the preemption requirements. In this example, we see that we prefer slots that have the lowest total job runtime to preempt if many slots match in order to minimize bad put. There is an additional knob, max job retirement time, a starty knob, which overrides preemption. This allows an admin to say, well, no matter what, don't preempt a job for at least this amount of time. This is commonly used when preemption is enabled in order to guarantee some minimum runtime to jobs to make progress. In this case, we are saying that every job that lands here cannot be preempted for the first hour of their runtime. Note that this can also be an expression. So you could say things like, jobs from a certain submitter get 10 hours, and everyone else just get one hour. And this leads us to our last truth. Even when preemption is on, max job retirement time can guarantee that every job gets one hour runtime. So we've now seen how to give one user, submitter really, twice the cores of another by setting the priority factor with the counter user priority tool. We've learned that with the negotiator settings, we can only prioritize based on the submitter, not the type of job or the attributes of the job, such as multi coreness With max job retirement time, we've seen how to guarantee every job gets at least one hour of runtime, even when preemption is on. And with concurrency limits, we've seen how to limit licensed jobs to some fixed number, independent of what submitter owns them or what SCEDIs they are submitting from. Of course, Condor is very configurable and very flexible, and it turns out there is a way to schedule multi-core jobs before single-core jobs. Remember, the negotiator will only hand out matches for jobs that match the slots. So, what we can do, in this case, is to craft a starty start expression that only matches multi-core jobs for some small, fixed amount of time after it enters the idle state. This allows multi-core jobs to run on those machines before single-core jobs because it only matches the multi-core jobs for that time frame, and thus avoids starvation of large jobs. But here we've ended our talk about the negotiator, priorities, and submitter scheduling. For more information, please check out the Condor manual at htcondor.readthedocs.io, or subscribe to the HD Condor user's mailing list whose subscription information is found under the main HD Condor webpage, which is at htcondorproject.org. Thank you for your time, and I hope you enjoy using and administrating HD Condor.